Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Father, you teach us about your omnipresence. You teach us, Father, to delight in your presence. And in it, there are different and varying degrees of your presence. Each one with different purposes and different effects. We ask, O oh God, that we may recognize your presence and all the multitudes of your presence, that we can receive all that you want us to receive. We give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we ask, O oh God, that you continue to establish us in the fullness of your presence. All the different aspects of it. We thank you, Father, for changing and transforming us in every way as we wait upon you, as we see that your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. You all remember the story of uh, Jesus and Mary and Martha. And uh, Martha likes to serve, Mary likes to hear the word. And in the end, when Martha was anxious about serving Jesus, Jesus told her, and she is so anxious that she even wanted to involve Mary in the serving. And of course, when Jesus comes and visits our house, and uh, he physically comes, they would like to impress him and do the best possible. But many times people don't realize what Jesus is really looking for. In fact, in the natural, when the natural people involve, uh, like uh, people who are like Jesus said, great among the Gentiles, then um, people try to impress them in various, various ways. And that's because they are leaders of the earth. But Jesus being a leader from heaven, Jesus being a being from heaven, is mainly interested in heavenly things. That's why Jesus chose to be born in a manger. That's why Jesus lived a very simple life. That's why Jesus left behind nothing except his words. In the same way, we need a detachment to appreciate that the presence of God is what we most desire. And Jesus told Martha the words that we need to hearken to, saying, Martha, Martha, thou art anxious about many things. And he says he should be like Mary. He says, who has the good part? So there are things that are uh, okay, there are things that are good, there are things that are better, there are things that are best. But nothing is as wonderful as knowing the presence of God in our life. And we have said that there are basic points that we slowly give on the presence of God. But we need to understand uh, the presence of God might have different uh, things. And this area here where we are looking at, the top part is there are different levels of God's presence. That's what we know. It's, it's understood God's uh, presence can be different levels and uh, can be outer court, holy place, or most holy place, and there are other heavenly dimensions of God's presence. Then God's presence can be deep, deep within us. And uh, in terms of uh, levels of God's presence, let's uh, give another word for that. This level would be, I, I would say, uh, the heavenly, how heavenly that presence is. And then when you talk about depths, how transforming is that presence? The presence of God transformed. And so when it's deep, it transforms us. And I illustrated with how King Saul has the presence of God when the anointing of God came on him. So much that he temporarily changed into another man when he's under that presence. Yet in spite of being so many years under the presence of God, he was not transformed at all. He remained a bad person, an evil person in the end. He became from bad, he became evil. And uh, in the end, the Holy Spirit left him. It says when the Spirit left him, the evil spirit came upon him. And uh, one of the things is when, when God opens us to the spirit realm, the spirit realm, once we are accustomed to it, If we neglect the things of the Spirit, suddenly the enemy is waiting to just come in. 
to replace the vacuum caused by uh, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God leaving. An example of that we see here of uh, King Saul. Let's start this place. And um, look at where the anointing of God came upon him. And uh, it's before his coronation and the anointing of God first came. And uh, when he lost the donkeys, it says here. <clears throat> ah, yes, chapter 9. And God has already revealed who he is going to anoint to be king because there's a demand to be king. And it says in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 15, The Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before, this, uh, before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel. So the story goes on about the lost donkeys and looking for lost donkeys, but God used that area and, uh, in order to bring Samuel to meet up with Saul. Chapter 10. Samuel anointed Saul, and there's the presence of God that was revealed, and says, um, when you depart, for me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zilzah. And they will say to you, donkeys which you went to look for have been found, and now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys, and is worrying about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go forth from there, come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There are three men going up to God at battle will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, and you shall receive from their hands. After that you will come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you have come there to the city, that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a string instrument and a tambourine, a flute and a harp before them. They will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. That's a special presence. And you will prophesy with them. And look at the last words there. Be turned into another man. So he could have been. He potentially could change into a better person. But the change was temporary. It's a temporary change. He could not hold on to the change. Thus, his life was never changed, never transformed. The anointing, the presence of God was there, he experienced everything, but he didn't enter deeply within. Whereas here is um, uh, something that David mentioned about how when God rebuked him for sin, and he's repenting for the sin with Bathsheba, uh, when, the, when Nathan the prophet went, after he had gone to Bathsheba, and here he desired to be changed inwardly. And I know it, I had to use Old Testament because if I use New Testament and say yes, they will be born again. But this Old Testament before they're born again. And he says, uh, Wash me thoroughly for my iniquity, cleanse me for my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil, that, may be, uh, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And then he acknowledged sin nature in verse 5. And like I thought on um, Friday night, that uh, when you acknowledge sin nature, the next part is acknowledge that the law cannot help you. Grace can help you. And that's where acknowledgement, humility, and then you obtain grace. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. You see, in the hidden part, he was interested in what was going on on his inside. Then he says in verse 10, create in me a clean heart. He wants a transformation from inside. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. David, of course, has his flaws. We know his life as a young man, and you know his life as a, as a adult, 
and his life as an uh, old man. You can see that he got better and better and better and better, and by the time he's ready to meet God, he lived a steady life in God. Uh, he's called the sweet psalmist of uh, Israel. So there's a desire for transformation, and, and he tells God in verse 11, Do not cast me away from your presence. See, he wants a presence. He says, uh, uh, if you want to take away your presence, I'd rather die. And he says, he wants God's presence so much in him, and he says, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He's a man who desires God's presence, who understands the value of having the constant presence in his life, not temporarily, but all the time. You know, some people, they only want the presence of God some of the time, when they need God. At other times, they want to enjoy their natural life. But the natural life, you can enjoy it better with God. God is not opposed to you enjoying His creation. It is important to have God's presence with us all the time, so there is such a thing as the presence of God working on our inside. Another good example is the one in Luke chapter 24, two disciples on the way to Emmaus. And uh, when, you, when you analyze uh, two disciples on the way to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, let's analyze it with our little chart. And uh, here's the story in verse 13. Two of them were walking on the way to Emmaus, and then Jesus joined them. They were talking different things. Jesus uh, prevented them from knowing who he was. Their eyes were restrained, and they did not know the Lord. Uh, and they hear the voice, they see this man uh, and uh, manifest in front of them. And as he talked with them, uh, he pretended not to know. He said, uh, which is why, again, this is a strong statement I talk about the uh, omnipresence of God. Jesus knows everything, but he still asks questions. What things? Pretend not to know. But he wanted them to speak forth. Because he is Jesus himself. And then they say the things concerning Jesus and Nazareth. If only they knew Jesus and Nazareth was right next to them. And then he said, Oh foolish ones and slow heart to believe. And he says, beginning at, the, at Moses and at the prophets, he expounded to them the scripture. So there is Jesus physically manifest to them. They might have passed a lot of people, but nobody knew it was Jesus. They looked at like three men walking. But when he spoke, his words stir something on their inside. It tells us here, after they realized it was Jesus, they said, did not our heart burn while he talked with us on the road? So sometimes people ask me, no, I'm the person God, I feel, I feel, I feel hot, 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 my hand hot. Okay, la, that one possibly healing. Oh, my ear hot, ear hot. <laughs> oh, maybe hearing. Uh. And, uh, oh, oh, inside hot, inside hot. Okay, maybe you need something on your inside. My bone hot, my bone hot. In fact, Jeremiah says, you know, God's word is like fire in my bones. Or oh, felt something about you. I know. Don't worry about feeling here, feeling there, you know, he touch your head, touch your what. I felt it sometimes, you know, I'm sitting down, reading, doing something, or I'm typing or doing something. Then you feel this, this presence behind you. Have anyone felt like this presence behind, like someone touching your hair, kind of thing? Uh, or are they angelic presence or the Spirit of God or something, something on your shoulder, like the hand of the Lord is on you. Uh, and so all these things, each of them, is an aspect of presence. Uh, yes. What about goosebumps? Uh, goosebumps goosebumps uh, can be from God or can be, you know, a natural <laughs> thing. So not all goosebumps. You know, some goosebumps just caused by goose. Uh, anyway, you know, so, uh, so uh, goosebumps could be sometimes, sometimes you feel that. Uh, when uh, I know I've been atmosphere where the spirit of God can be very strong, you feel rose, uh, 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 like wave and wave of goosebumps, yeah, uh, uh, coming. So that the side effect. So uh, goosebumps is side effect because God will not purposely make your hair stand up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Just to tell His presence, uh, it is a side effect. And in the book of Job, goosebumps can be caused by evil spirits also. Mm, in the book of Job, he said, the spirit came and my hair stood up. 
and uh, there's, there's a verse in the book of Job that I showed before. Uh, so it can be can be the Holy Spirit, can be God, uh, can be evil spirit, or can actually be just because it's too cold. Uh, you're reacting to it, right? So somebody, somebody need the presence of God, so turn all the aircon very cold. <laughs> they got all kinds of goosebumps, side effect. Or, or you think about, you know, remember the story I told about how, you know, uh, there's, there's a holy presence, everyone singing hallelujah, and, uh, and the only thing many people didn't know was that, um, you know, in the church, you know, the parsonage is nearby, and the parsonage has a, has a cat. And so while everybody was worshipping, everybody trying to sense the Lord, the presence of God, and uh, so somebody who need healing or somebody, and the cat happened to come to the service, and nobody knew. I know cats they like to climb very high, and so this person, you know, really praying to God fervently for his healing, and then suddenly the cat was very high, jumped from part of the ceiling and landed on his back, and so landed he felt something. He said, "Hallelujah, God is on me! God is on me!" The cat comes running away, so nobody saw the cat. Hallelujah! And the funny thing, he also got healed. <laughs> so some people just need a trigger, you know, and um, so they release it from their face. So. Uh, you know, if, if, if it's so, so easy, uh, you can just train cats. <laughs> and then you got train cat, you give a signal, all the cats jump on everybody. And before you can look around, they disappear. Say, someone touch me! Okay, you know, it was not the woman with the issue of blood, it was a cat. Right. So, uh, anyway, we've seen animals do different things. And uh, I did mention how in, in my house, one in Canberra, a visitor from Melbourne, who is my intercessor. And uh, when we pray, we used to make and close eyes. And I had my big dog walking up and down. So he happened to be sitting around. And so he closed his eyes praying. I closed my eyes, I'm laying hands. Then, and, and then this guy, his eyes pray. Then he felt something else lay on him, you know on his head kind of thing. Then, uh, then, uh, then I, I also felt my dog was around there. I opened my eyes. I saw my dog also copy me. <laughs> and he's a big fella, so he's putting his paw on it. So his paw is quite soft and nice. You know, maybe felt like the Holy Ghost kind of thing. <sighs> yeah. So, uh, and this person opened it. Hey, why is this dog laying hands on me? So I'm getting a blessing, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, but he knew it was a, a dog, so he didn't he didn't scream out and say, "I felt an angel lay hands on me." My angel got furry hand. No, uh, and so sometimes it's just naturally caused. But the good thing is, this one was internal. Uh, internal sense in the sense that they have warm sensation inside, and so there will be. Uh, Something that transformed them, something changing on their inside. Uh, and so sometimes sometimes the presence of God have all four. Now there are more than four, I just uh, put four first. And different levels, different depths, how deep it. Like David, he says, you know, create in me a clean heart. He want a creative work inside him. He desired that. And, uh, too bad it's the Old Testament, he couldn't really be born again, but he could receive what he can. Then there's a lateral effect. Lateral effect is uh, it works outwards, and um, a lateral effect would be what I call it's uh, uh, natural, uh, natural uh, side effects. Sometimes there's um, side effects that happen. Uh, we mentioned how when uh, Daniel was sitting in the Tigris River and uh, then he saw an angel Gabriel who just came from war dressed in his full armor appearing in the vision and as he's approaching him all his other people who did not see it clear, he did not see the vision they felt something they felt something terrifying coming near and then they quickly run and uh, that one we quoted in the uh, uh, first service in the book of Daniel. I'd like to point to something else here. And here is Daniel. <clears throat> See, at the river Tigris, the Tigris River, then he lifted up his eyes. He's sitting there with his companions. And he saw this full flesh uh, wearing of armor. This is the first time he see Angel Gabriel that way. 
because he just came for warfare. Otherwise, he'd be just wearing like in a robe of white. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision in verse 7. For the people who were with me did not see the vision. But a great terror fell on them. Here's the thing. When people, when angels appear, it can also terrify people. So you cannot judge whether something is, is from God or not from God by people's reaction. I can guarantee you, if it could be God manifesting and people are frightened. So they say, oh, people are frightened, cannot be God. That's human reaction. Otherwise, why do angels always say, fear not? Because there is a terrifying reaction when there's an appearance in a spiritual dimension. You judge whether something is from God or not from God, not by its technicality, not by its various possible ways of manifesting, but by the content. By the content, what actually it is, and what is the revelation involved? Is it in line with the Word of God? And uh, not by people's reaction to it. And the uh, lateral effect of, um, of that is uh, everybody fled. They ran. In fact, the word fled is to move away very fast. Uh, flee. To flee is like running away. None of them got any benefits, but they felt something. Even when the Damascus Road experience happened to Paul, all his companions felt something, but they didn't know what it was. Now, I would classify falling under the power as lateral effect. <coughs> By itself, falling under the power has no, no benefit whether you fall or don't fall. It's the presence of God. And... And there is many different level, many different dimensions of God's presence. There is a uh, heavenly level, levels. There is death, there is transformed, lateral, which is natural side effect, material, which could be the power, uh, the content or the power uh, level of God's presence, and it could be power. It could be depth of revelation, and uh, there is the there is the curvy thing I put all around different materials of God's presence that is possible and in that way you don't always assume one kind of presence sometimes out of four only one aspect is revealed I've shown only one aspect is revealed like when Hannah uh, when, when uh, these uh, two disciples on the way to Emmaus that's just a transformation they were being transformed by the word of God there's a certain material because Jesus was revealing things to them. See, not all the presence of God need to have signs and wonder signs and wonder they got God's presence. When you don't have God's uh, presence or signs and wonders, it is just that God is not manifesting the power part. Okay, look at Daniel. Besides the miracle of uh, him being protected, there are two miracles in Daniel. One is he protected from the lions. The second is the three young men being protected from the fire. Outside of that, the book of Daniel is mainly revelation and knowledge and wisdom. It's, it's end time knowledge and wisdom. That requires a certain level of presence. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talked about having visions uh, even to the level of third heaven. Nothing is mentioned about him being totally healed. In fact, Paul says he's still fighting infirmities. But the presence of God was for revelation. And that revelation was to seal something within him. So not all the presence of God need necessarily produce power. It can produce a revelation, different material. It might not have a side effect. Nobody needs to fall under the power. I mean, imagine the anointing for teaching. You know, you come in, boom, everyone fall. So everyone, and then I have to teach to a group of people who are sleeping on the floor. And then at the end, you get up and say, hey, what do you say? Well, what did I teach? Huh? I say, yeah, your soul never got anything, only your spirit got it. And so that would not be the kind of anointing God wants to manifest. And even healing anointing, there are many different types. It's not necessary to always fall. The funny thing about it is this. The falling under the power phenomena, you see, when people begin to believe and look for something, those things increase. So it was only during the charismatic time, popularized a lot by Catherine Kuhlman, of slaying under the spirit, she gave a term, that almost every ministry after that wants to see that. 
And the more you want to see that, of course, part of your belief system, faith will produce that because that's what you desire to see. The thing about it is before the charismatic revival, you have the healing revival. The healing revival under, under people like uh, 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 William Branham and under people uh, like, uh, let me think of some of the faith healers that God has used, um, even uh, people like T.L. Osborne uh, long ago, and um, some of these uh, of people who really um, uh, were, were bringing healing. And I met with Don Gossett. You know, Don Gossett uh, is one of the m modern charismatic preachers, and he and uh, I brought him into Asia for the first time. In fact, Benny Hinn, Don Gossett, we we were the first to bring people to Asia last time. Some of these people who never traveled before. And so when Don Gossett came, uh, and I spent some private time with him, and he told me about the people he as a young man served under. He said a lot of them, uh, they re he really got a lot of miracles, but what they have is uh, they don't have much teaching. In their meeting, not much teaching. In fact, the, the beginning, they just exhort a little bit, and then they start praying for people, one by one. Very few people fall under the power, but a lot of them got healed. Then in some meetings, a lot of people fall under power, very few healed, very few people healed. And then in between is a group of people like John G. Lake, who saw both. And uh, John G. Lake, when he was training a group of young students, because John G. Lake had a little Bible school going, and then when he allowed them to pray, one of them was so excited because he prayed for everyone, everyone fell under power. And then he excited came to him. And John G. Lake says, yes, but how many of them were healed? They came for healing, they didn't come to fall. So the student actually got rebuked. Because he was using his faith and energy to make people fall, but not make people uh, get healed. And uh, so, uh, people like Smith Wigglesworth, not interested in people falling. He just wants to get you healed. So we need to understand that sometimes there's lateral effect, sometimes there's no lateral effect. You should not be worrying about it. Just like we should not worry about goosebumps, so don't worry about whether people fall under the power or not. Do not take that just because people fall under the power, the meeting is powerful. You can have the whole congregation fall under power, which could happen, and people are blessed, but you got less healing than everybody got healed without falling. Because there are different type of presence, and when we begin to lock our heart and mind to one type of presence, you are limiting God. Do not limit God. God is unlimited. Why should we keep wanting to limit Him? If you give God the freedom to be unlimited, He will show you things you've never seen before. And here's my question looking at the Bible. How many people in the Bible in Jesus' ministry fell under the power when Jesus was healing. Almost none. The only people who fall were the demons coming out. And the other time when everybody fell under the power was not for healing anybody. It is because uh, there was a confrontation between two energies when Judas Iscariot came to arrest him and they looked for Jesus and Jesus said, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus for all his energy and prayer says, I am he, because he's like proclaiming. And he says, all of them fell. The bad guys all fell under the power. The only one healed that day was the servant who got the ear cut, and he never fell under power. Why? Fell under power, you're going to stick the ear to him while he's under that. So let's not judge the presence of God. This is all wrong teaching and people's wrong phenomena, wrong expectation. And uh, uh, when they uh, go to a meeting, well, everyone fall under power, they say it must be a powerful meeting. But then the cripples still go out cripple, the blind still go out blind. And I don't think it's a powerful. I think powerful is when people are actually healed. That's right. In Jesus' ministry and in Paul's ministry, 
very few people fall under the power, but a lot of people got healed. So it's important for us to understand these are the different uh, possible dimensions of God. But sometimes one aspect is shown, sometimes all four aspects. And then you've got many effects taking place. And God has His reason and purposes for showing each level of God's presence that is there. And then these are the principles that we are seeking to teach that we need to accept the fact that God's presence is everywhere. So you always understand that in this meeting, God is present. And you got scriptures for that. I didn't put in the scriptures. Uh, the scriptures for that is Matthew uh, 28, verse 19 and 20. And um, some, uh, Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. So that is of course, and then you got Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So are you saying that Jesus is lying? No. Even one person Jesus, uh, with one person you can use a Matthew 28 one, um, even if your name is not low, when, when Jesus says, low, I'm with you, even to the end of the age. It doesn't mean he's talking to Mr. Low. Right? So, when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, he says, it was 24, where two or three gather together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And so, uh, you have Matthew 18, verse 20. The presence is always there. It's whether we feel the presence or not, whether we know the presence of God or not. And so we look at all the different... Uh, there are more than four points, but I f figure that just four points would be a good start for this uh, foundational series on the presence of God. Uh, the presence of God can be all these uh, dimensions. When Jesus says, um, I will manifest to you, then Jesus says, I and the Father will come to you. So these are all different levels of, of God's presence how heavenly His presence is. It is uh, and each of them can be measured by different degree. Like, uh, for example, uh, in a lateral effect, if God wants to, want to move His presence laterally, one of the greatest manifestations of God's lateral presence is in the giving of the Ten Commandments. The whole mountain was filled with God's presence. And you could literally hear the horns blowing, not by humans. And God's presence descended on the mountain until the mountain changed. The mountain top changed. It was different. And, and the side effect on the mountain was that. And so there is a very powerful manifestation of God's lateral presence. And um, so there can be uh, transforming presence, depth of presence, level of heavenly presence. And uh, there can be a very high degree when um, Isaiah had a vision. Not sure whether anybody was with him. In Isaiah chapter 6, he saw the glory of God and he himself began to call out, Woe unto me for a man of unclean lips. So that is a different presence. I uh, didn't record any lateral presence. I know it was transforming because he desired to be changed. So it was a transforming and it was a heavenly presence. You can see that two working. As far as a material side, in terms of revelation and power, not much demonstrate, but at that time God anoint him and sent him out. Because the main thing God wants to see is, whom do I send now? I want to send someone. And he responded. So everything was transforming him and he anointing upon, anointing uh, the work upon his life as a prophet of God. The second point that I said we want to go into that you will notice that affect the presence of God here is the presence or absence of certain people. It can either increase or diminish the presence of God. Which is why sometimes you could prepare a message or you could prepare a song or worship and you expect a certain atmosphere. Then when you stand up on the actual day, the atmosphere seems to be changed or different. 
Because the presence of one person, the presence of two person, or a group of them can change the presence. And sometimes I can tell you, God does not want to reveal some levels of this presence because people are not ready. Or sometimes God just don't want to benefit those who are not there. Let me give and prove this second point from the Bible. You see in the ministry of Elisha the prophet, in 2 Kings, 2 Kings, um, we will look at chapter 3 here. Now, Elisha has already the, have the double the anointing of Elijah. And um, three kings went out to war. So, when they went out to war, it's, uh, the king, he says in verse 10, the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called these three kings together, deliver their hand of Moab. They, they know they're going to lose the battle against the Moabites. Then verse 11, Jehoshaphat asked. Jehoshaphat is a good king, but the only weakness of Jehoshaphat is he go and um, uh, allow his, his son to marry the daughter of uh, Jezebel. And remember, the daughter of Jezebel later became a queen and wanted to kill all of the descendants of David. Only one baby escaped, which the high priest escaped with. And so, you can marry the wrong person. And that was a weakness of Joshua. He liked friendship so much. And... Uh, so that they, they allow, in those days it was a rich marriage. So when their children marry, their kingdoms are closer together. Imagine having the best pal, the best, your best friend uh, is King Ahab. Terrible, isn't it? And that was to his doom and desire. Later you read the life of Jehoshaphat, the prophets rebuke him and say, why do you keep making friend there? You know, as if you cannot find any other friend. Uh, and, um, so, but he's a good king. He, he's a good man. Uh, still, in spite of his weaknesses, they say, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of King Israel said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here who poured water on the hands of Elijah. He used to serve Elijah. Then the king says, Okay, the Lord, word of the Lord is with him. Let's go and seek his counsel. We need God's help. We need prophetic help now. So when they go, and uh, he, uh, uh, you know, Elisha says to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go, go to the prophets of your father, prophets of your mother. He's talking, you know, ask him to go back to uh, all his um, um, false prophets from the time of Ahab and uh, Jezebel. And, um, and the king of Israel says, no, for the Lord has called these three things together. And then Elisha answered, Surely, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, I will not let, look at you or see you. Don't you think the prophet sounds very rude? But he's not being rude. He's telling the truth. He will not function and draw on the presence of God. And on that day, they had a miracle. So that was the presence of God with a powerful, powerful material effect. He did not want to function in front of this guy. Now, sometimes their presence makes no difference. See, God's presence um, is very complex. There is a presence where Jesus was facing all these people standing against him and he still did a miracle. That is more a confronting miracle where he's challenging them. But there is enough like a balance of faith that is there. So I'm going to show you because this is a very important point. I show you that it's all over the place, Old Testament, New Testament. We go over to Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus went to his hometown. 
And the hometown people did not regard Jesus as a prophet. They had no faith in Jesus as a prophet or even Jesus as a man of God, much less the Messiah. So they keep talking about him as a carpenter. He's a prophet, not accepted as a prophet in his hometown. He's only accepted as a carpenter. He will never be accepted as a prophet. Verse 3, is this not the carpenter? They're calling Jesus a carpenter. That's all they can accept of him. Of course, a few people might believe in him. Jesus said, prophet is not without honor except in his own country. And he says, he could do no, zero, no mighty work there, except he lay hands on a few people and then he healed them. Isn't it strange? This is Jesus we're talking about. And Jesus carried the fullness of God's presence. But that presence that is inside him cannot come out because of the people. You will find a different presence each time. Let's say, you know, if you are a preacher preaching, you could feel whether the sermon bounced back or not. So if you have never preached a group of people who, who are, you know, sometimes you're supposed to proclaim in, in the midst of like that. I remember uh, in Melbourne long, long ago, I was preaching there and preaching in different places. Then they, uh, they took, took me to a church and then I was given all the instructions. It says, hey, this church don't believe in the Trinity. You know, there's sin, salvation, or white. Then when I reached there, you know what God said? Preach on the Trinity. <laughs> so I, I came, at, maybe, maybe that was the last, first and last chance that they get to hear the message. Then they have to answer to God. And so I got out and said, the Lord told me to preach about the Trinity. And you could see their eyes roll. <laughs> and as I was preaching, it was like preaching to a wall. But I know to a few people it might have reached. But God said, don't you, you just preach as it is. And, uh, and you could feel the message bouncing back and not entering the people. It's a funny atmosphere. Very funny atmosphere. And uh, then at times, sometimes when we travel, let's say we go to another country, we go, maybe the people know that, you know, like, you, know, you, you guys have me every week, you know, three times a week, so sometimes you say, hey, you know, four times good enough, like, don't see anymore, you know, cannot digest so much sermons. And uh, so perhaps we go to a different country where they, had, they got only one chance uh, for a week and uh, they don't have a chance, so the people come very hungry. Then when they were hungry, suddenly you feel a different type of presence because the hunger is drawing out, drawing out the presence. And uh, so the presence can change based on, because the presence is always there, we establish first point. But the presence can change based on people, based on people. And uh, in, I, in this sermon, I'll be quoting a lot of Kennedy again. Uh, Kenneth E. Hagin, in his book, I Believe in Visions, mentioned in one of the visions where Jesus appeared to him. And he said, it's almost like a story from the Peanuts. You know, the Peanuts, Linus and Snoopy. And Snoopy sometimes sits on the typewriter in his doghouse. Don't know why he's sitting on top of the doghouse typing the writer, typewriter. And in his typewriter, he always keeps typing the story. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> so anyway, it was a dark and stormy night on one of the days where he was preaching in a, in a, in a I guess, a small size church. And because of the snow and the storm in one of his, the places he went to, on that night, it was supposed to be an evangelistic meeting. Not many people came. Very few people came. And so the few people that came, they had to make it through the dark and stormy night. In the cold, in the wind, you put on all your winter clothes, walk in the thing, go to church, you know, the, take it out again. Because you wear thick clothes and if you got heater on, you're supposed to take it out so that you don't overheat. And uh, so you, they, and then you got to sit down and the church got to be warm up. And uh, then as... Uh, 
And then he looked around, everybody was born again, everybody was a Christian, there were just a handful of people. And so the church was practically empty. And he is good, he flew with his way and said, let's make it a prayer meeting. So on that night, they had a prayer meeting, and if you read carefully in this book, the presence of God was so strong, that the moment he kneeled down, when his knees touched the floor, phew, he was taken up into heaven. Few people chosen by God. The presence just go like that. It is not necessary the quantity or the number of people. It is actually the quality of people's heart that will determine the presence of the Lord flowing. So this is, and then one chapter before Mark 5 is this um, area of um, of the big crowd that is coming uh, to Jesus and uh, as you have all these people coming to Jesus and wanting to be healed of uh, various uh, sickness and, and, and disease um, there is this woman with the issue of blood uh, uh, who was healed along the way. But the purpose was Jesus was going to Jairus' house to bring healing to Jairus' daughter, who on their way there, Jairus' daughter died. And anyway, this woman was healed. Uh, and he had, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, because when he went near to Jairus, um, uh, J on the way to Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue's house, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. So remember, the whole journey started because of this guy. And he's the ruler of the synagogue. And along the way, the woman, the issue of blood got healed. But he's continued. Uh, While well, this woman got healed as he was talking, the news came that Jairus' daughter is no more sick, but actually worse, she died. And when she died, Jesus turned around and they, which is what I sometimes teach people that when people say a word against a miracle and you want a miracle you must say a word to con contradict them because this is not spiritual battle so they said to him and they said you know no need, no need to trouble the master your daughter really died and when he heard the word he quickly speaks something and he says do not be afraid only believe now that cancel what was being spoken and verse 37 here's an interesting thing he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. In fact, when he saw, when he came to the house, he saw the funeral service already going on, and uh, they make a commotion. Then he make a confession of faith again. He said, "Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping." And then verse forty, they ridicule him and they mock him. And then you know what he did in verse 40? Look at the words there, here. When he had put them all outside, he chased the funeral service party away. And the professional mourners. All got chased away. Because one life is at stake. It's worth it to chase everybody away. So he did two things. He removed people away, and he only let three of his twelve disciples go with him. And the father, and the parents of the child. Then he took, uh, he says that, he took the father, the mother of the child, and those who were with him, there is the three of them. And entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by hand and said, Talita Kumi. Now that's not a magic word like uh, 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 Abracadabra. Abracadabra. Okay. It was not Abracadabra. That's Talita Kumi. It's not. Talita Kumi means damsel arise. So don't use it as a magic word. And uh, to us, it's not like Talita Kumi. No, it's not that. So which is translated? Little girl arise and she arose straight away 
What will happen if one of the monas or the radical people were hiding in one corner? <laughs> Jesus might say, somebody is still here. <laughs> but he would know it. But maybe if one of us and in need the atmosphere, we would be we doing and say, Talita Kumi. Hey, why didn't it work? Abracadabra also doesn't work. Uh, then so arrives also doesn't work. Because there's one guy there <coughs> hiding in a corner. Because sometimes the presence or the absence of people affect the glory of God and the presence of God manifesting. Because God's glory, um, it depends on what level He's, he's manifesting and it's important to do that. And it's not the more the merrier. Here's another example in the book of Acts chapter 12. In the book of Acts, it could be 9, let me look at that. And, uh, oh, this is uh, before. Uh, oh, this earlier, earlier, sorry. Earlier, that's before Cornelius. Before Cornelius is 10. Um... Chapter 9, uh, chapter, chapter 9, verse 36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Talita, and, uh, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works, charitable deeds, which she did. It happened in those days, she became sick and died. When they washed her, they lay in the upper room, and uh, since, since uh, Lida was near Joppa, and the disciples heard Peter was there, they sent two men to him, asking him to come. These are all New Testament believers. So Peter came, when he came, he brought him to the upper room, that is upstairs, and all the widows stood by him. A <laughs> <laughs> lot of them. So multiply this voice by a hundred. <laughs> multiply by five hundred. <laughs> all food downstairs. They love her, but they don't know how to exercise faith. And so there's all this crying. Eh? By the time you won't finish on the way upstairs, you also want to cry. So, you know, crying is contagious, just as like laughing. Uh, nah. So, you know what Peter did? He copied what Jesus did. Uh, when he says there, verse 40, he put them all out. Out! Of course, he might have done it politely. Actually, remember, you all can change a style that is polite. You can either say, Up! And then you're dictator type. Man of God for God's man, God's hour. Man of God's power for the hour. Rise! Yeah, 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 yeah. We know you could do that. You can also do polite way. Uh, would you mind all of you go out? Then they all go, they say, Thank you, thank you. And then you go up. Arise. Like, it's just a matter of style. It doesn't mean that you have to be the, the, a dictator to do a miracle. Right? So I'm sure, you know, they might have done it politely. And so, these are all nice women. They're touched, they're crying, they miss her. They're there not because they want to hinder the miracle. But, they will hinder the miracle. Yeah, upstairs they're trying to raise the dead. Downstairs, oh, oh, she's dead, she's dead. You know, it will hinder the miracle. So he has to put them all outside the house, all out, and perhaps, perhaps online now, someone, someplace, somewhere praying for resurrection, and it failed. Maybe this could be your failure. You're supposed to be alone with the corpse. <laughs> and uh, you got all these people seeming to help, but all of them out there looking at you. You're mad, lah. I want to raise this person up on the dead. Anyway, so, and uh, when he put them out, he said, Tabita, arise. She opened her eyes, and then she sat up. And now, come on, get all the windows back. <laughs> right, because we need that window of God's presence to raise the dead. And uh, so, uh, when she's risen from the dead, look at what he did. Verse 41, this is a pastor. He called all the saints and widows to come back. So all they come in. Uh, 
Right. So you have to slowly change them. And so it is important to see that uh, there is a point where the absence or the presence of certain people could actually affect. But God being God, there is a level of presence where I don't care whether I'm a believer there or not. And at that time, even people who don't believe are present, like in the synagogue, in Mark, and uh, another time, I think I can use a Mark story, but let me highlight the word uh, presence. And this is the one in the Gospels. And we only are interested in one here. Um, not this one. Uh, Okay, I find it in my own way. Sometimes this one is not so good. Let's look at the one in Gospel of Mark. Because Mark starts with the synagogue. And um, Jesus went to a synagogue. And uh, here he is. Um, let's see the one where he challenged in the synagogue. Uh, yes, this is one of the first miracles. And... Um, Okay, the records here in Mark is a bit different, but here uh, is chapter 2 of Mark. And it says, Jesus went to Capernaum, and there he was preaching, and then they brought a paralytic. And the paralytic was lying there. And then when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. But that day, sitting around were scribes and Pharisees. And in their heart they say, why, why, how can this guy do like that? How dare he forgive sin? Who does he think he is? Think he's God or something. And they say, how, this, why does this man speak blasphemy? In their heart they say, blasphemy! And immediately Jesus perceived what they were doing. In spite of the opposition, Jesus still did the miracle. In spite of so much opposition, there were a lot of Pharisees there. Jesus even rebuked them. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sin. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up. So you say, how can this contradictory thing happen? I believe because on that day, the people who bring him there, their faith is that much. And the opposition, that much. So if way okay, there was like a support system, that by the time these four people, this is Jesus, how much time do you need to climb on the roof? That's a lot of time. How much time do you need to dig a hole in somebody's ceiling that is made from concrete or whatever? So they take time to dig a hole. And the hole has to be big enough. You cannot dig one small hole. And then you tie a rope around the person's neck and then let him down slowly. <laughs> then you might need another miracle raising the dead besides healing him. <laughs> and this man hanging there. You know, you just, you just kill a man. But it's to be big enough. And this is a paralyzed man. So the hole needs to be big enough to slowly let the man down. And, and Jesus was preaching. So as he was preaching, there was a lot of noise up there. Jesus knew what was happening, but nobody else knew. And actually it was Peter's house. Yeah, Peter, you know, when he, when he's looking up, he's like, what's happening to my roof? <laughs> so when people dig the, dig the ceiling, usually the, down there the powder starts falling. And then more and more, more and more, and suddenly as they see, <laughs> suddenly sunlight appears. <laughs> and then at first, it has to be a small hole. Then they see, look like somebody's eyes looking down. And then, and then it got bigger and bigger until it's big enough, somebody's head appears. <laughs> And, and then Peter might be looking at, I wonder how much is this costing me? <laughs> I'm going to repair. Having my house for meeting not good enough, I'm going to repair the house. You know, providing food not good enough, I'm going to repair the house. And so, you know, this, this man really have faith. 
They were not going back empty-handed. You know, by the time they, they, they remember, they tried to bring the normal way. You think that was their first choice? Huh? You will be meant to make the first choice. That was their last choice. They, have, they must have tried different ways. Maybe try to carry on top, cannot. You know, squeeze to the bottom, cannot. Squeeze to the top, cannot. They might try different ways already. Finally, they said, we must get him there. They knew we are not, and whatever his name, this guy's name, you know, uh, let's call him Joe. You know? Hey, Joe! Yeah. Right? He's paralyzed. Right? Yeah. We're getting you too. Okay. Okay. Don't give up. And then, and then they're carrying up. Say, he's down there. Why am I up here? Say, patient, we believe. All right, I believe in you. Say, Joe. And then by the time they're digging, and then the paralyzed man, maybe he could turn his head a little bit and say, Why are you guys doing? Say, Don't worry, you are going home healed. Alright. <laughs> so by the time they let Joe down, there's so much faith exercise. You know how many no's they face, how many problems they face, how many walls they face, and everything they tear down. So by the time they come down, there was enough faith to overcome a room full of Pharisees. So they still need to be the presence of certain people. Now, the presence of God is just the presence of God. We don't create it. It's God who manifests. But it does help to have people of faith. And the presence of God can be determined by who is there. Sometime additional one Pharisee uh, uh, addition, you know, everybody was good. Oh, everybody praying, praying, 20 people praying, beautiful, beautiful, hallelujah. And people are swaying, a few people fall under the power, oh, hallelujah. One Pharisee sit down. Ah! Well, the hallelujah we had to come up. <laughs> Suddenly the atmosphere changed one person. Right. Or the opposite, it can be very dull, very dead. And then, and then uh, everybody very discouraged, very, very down. One man of faith come. Poof, everybody pop up. It can be positive, it can be negative. Uh, it is important to know that law is present. The presence or absence of certain people can change the potential of God's presence for manifesting. That's an important note to know. But don't take this point eh, for blaming. Eh. <laughs> Everybody pray, pray through. Then they say, <laughs> because of you, lah. You, you, you should stay at home. <laughs> and we use it for blaming. It's not supposed to be for that. Right? Do not judge. Uh, and then, you know, look, you know, just look at yourself in the mirror. Uh, then uh, everybody look like that and say, oh, yeah, if I'm there, I might hinder the presence. Everybody stay at home. So all night we look. Nobody here. Then everybody SMS say, I'm staying home for your benefit. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what benefit? <laughs> right. And uh, we're all training to pray, kind of thing. So uh, don't be judgmental, don't use this point wrongly, but understand it is there. You cannot escape it. The presence of faith or the absence of faith will affect the whole atmosphere. And uh, when you've got a group of people already, and it does improve the atmosphere for God to manifest in whatever degree that He wants. Then I end with another third point, which is present. Sometimes there are tasks or tests to complete before the presence. So if you don't complete those tasks or tests, there is no presence. Even to, to, to uh, King Saul before he became a king, there were certain things he was told to do. So you must go here, you must go there, and then you will get God's presence. Or sometimes when, when you, people need a certain level of presence, let's say a discouraged prophet like uh, Elijah, 
And that was the one last and uh, the last time that he ever felt so discouraged. And that he wanted to die. An angel appeared to him was not good enough. Angel cooked his meal. He says, uh, uh, in, uh, yeah, here is it, First Kings uh, 19. And he says, uh, uh, I, oh, oh, the mirroring disappeared. Sorry. Okay. The mirroring disappeared. Okay, we got it back. First Kings 19. And um, he ran away from Jezebel in verse 4. And he ran one day's journey. I mean, you're very tired and a whole day uh, uh, running. He's actually running. Look at verse 3. He's running. Running, very tired, whole day, physically exhausted. And, and don't forget, he just did a fantastic thing, call down fire, kill all the false prophets. But now, uh, even though all the people acknowledged God, in the end he was still alone. And uh, Jezebel wanted to kill him. So he ran and ran one whole day. He came and sat down under the uh, sycamore tree, or is here, a broom tree, and he prayed that he wanted to die. He said, ah, oh, enough, lah. enough, enough. He didn't know he got some more ministry. He thought that's the end of his ministry. And then as he lay down and slept, an angel touched him and really made food for him. Arise and eat. He looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals. Uh, by the word cake, eh, uh, remember the word cake eh, is not like our modern cake. You know, Some of you thought uh, he sleep then go, what oh, chocolate cake? <laughs> oh, wow, carrot cake, you know. Have you ever tasted a very good chocolate cake? Um, a oh, very good carrot cake. Oh, really nice. If they really do it well. And so he got up. The cake was actually something that looked like none. You know, just a piece of dough kind of thing. And uh, so, then of course, and a jar of water, the angel brought it for him. He ate, he drank, he was very tired. Then he slept again. And uh, so, uh, the angel got, got him up the second time. And then uh, prepare him another meal. Say, arise and eat. So he got two good meals. And uh, so that's, that's good. And he arose and ate. And then he knew where he had to go. He had to go for 40 days and 40 nights. Travel all the way to Horeb. And Horeb is where uh, Moses also had encountered the Lord. So he went all the way to Horeb, long, long way. 40 days and 40 nights is one month and 10 days. It's a long time. Never eat. Walking. Just walking. That was part of the task and the test before God met him. You and I know God could meet him right under the broom tree. He don't need to travel 40 days. God is only present. But he has to travel as part of his task to meet God. So we don't understand sometimes God's commandment to go to a place. I remember in 2013, December, after I, I, I was given a new name by God, God says in February, you must go. But before you go, you must finish all your meditation. So I fervently keep writing, writing it because uh, I had to convert it all to A4 size at that time. It was the old, um, uh, uh, long, longer size, uh, uh, full scap size. And nowadays they don't sell full scap uh, pages. It's all A4. So rewrite it and then uh, travel. Then I, I welcome some of the leaders to follow. So about three of them follow. And it was a very holy time. And I know at that time, something took place. It's some sort of something took place. And um, uh, so, it was an important time uh, to absorb something of God's presence. You never know. And so that is uh, one of the cases that precedes uh, the presence. And when he traveled there, he, he was waiting, and then the Lord actually appeared. And because of how much test that he has gone through, you notice uh, never before do you have a side effect. This is again the lateral effect. The lateral effect was a strong wind, but the Lord was not in the wind. 
and uh, an earthquake, but the earthquake it says is not the Lord, it's side effect. Then there was a fire, and the Lord was not in the fire, until he hear a still small voice. So he has to wait till all these phenomena. That means it was a very great presence that, that affect and shake the earth. It was a different presence that day. And I can confirm that this is the last time he ever got discouraged. After that, he changed. And he, he waited until he hear the still small voice. And then he knew. It was a very intimate, special presence. When we analyze this presence with our little chart, it had a very heavenly presence, I know. It had a powerful lateral presence, but only for one person. And it had, it, it was so powerful, the whole earth shake. Rocks fell down. Very powerful. It had all four, but the most powerful was its transformation effect. That one still voice that he heard, then he came up and he met the presence of the Lord. Elijah is so used to angels. Don't forget, 40 days before, angels fed him twice. Many people see angels, oh, 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 I'm encouraged! <coughs> He's so discouraged, angels feed him also not encouraged enough. So imagine as he's eating the pieces of his naan or bread, uh, Angel, my lord, angel, angel don't speak much, you know. But if we were humans, say, come on, lah, be encouraged, lah, have another piece, lah, yeah, lah, praise the Lord, lah, hallelujah, lah, la 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 la. But here, all silent. Angel, you know, how many of you got angel cook for you? Twice. Angel food. And this 40 days fast coming in January. You will have wish that you got this special food. Eat once, last for 40 days. <laughs> what kind of meal is that? And it's not like it's not like 40 pieces. What for for they got all solo up and then he, he grow big. <laughs> no. No. Just a normal normal piece. He ate, was full. And don't know how it works, but that multiplication factor, he never felt hungry, and he used the energy for walking among mountains, climbing mountains, going to different places, and Horeb is a very high mountain, and all the energy was enough, and the presence of angel never encouraged him enough. He must be really low, very low. But when he met a very deep presence, the funny thing is, the, the deepest level of God's presence is very soft and very touching and loving. And when he met that, God told him what to do. Something came into him and he was never ever in his life again discouraged. God cured him of all those things. Some, some DNA change might have even taken place. But that's when you complete a task that God asks you. Before that, he was very obedient. There was nothing that he did wrong. He actually, he was, if you look at this graph, uh, he was obeying God, obeying God, obeying God, supernatural, supernatural. And then calling down fire was a high point. The whole country was there. The king who is against God, the queen who is against God was right there. It, it was a high note. And the fire of God was so powerful. But it went to the lowest note. You know why? Because sometimes you reach a certain point, it set all your soul energy, everything. So suddenly he felt, phew, he must have wanted to go on a higher point, but suddenly he found the lowest point in his life. But that was when God was still there. 
he had been faithful. So God continued to give him a task and 40 days later, it was, it was an encounter with God that he has never had before. He's already very close with God. But God can still discover new levels of presence. There will always be new levels of presence you have never encountered before. Until we go home face to face, there's still even if you if you graduate from this earth, your body transform, there will still be new levels of presence. Because God is God. If you really already encounter one hundred percent, you would have already be like Him, because each presence changes you, transform you. So He did His part carried out his part and praise the Lord for the encounter that he had. For, uh, for Moses, God was going to manifest together with him. He was going to function like God after he meet God, after he meet the angel in the uh, burning bush. So it tells us here, God gave him all the commandments, God told him what to do. And um, then in chapter 4, he got the three signs, the sign of the blood, turning water into blood, the sign of the leprous hand and the, and the rod. Three signs God gave to him. And um, in the end, he kept uh, trying not to obey God. And, uh, but God has to... Uh, tell him and you know how when you talk to God God seldom is angry but Moses when he keep on giving excuse after excuse he says in verse 13 when he give all the reason God reason with him you're too slow God says he has, he's the one who can make you speak verse 13 when God said please send someone else that was where God said God was angry. And when, after God chose him, and then when he says, send someone else, that made God angry. One of the lessons when you learn about Father God and God, don't ask him to send someone else. While he's talking to you, don't ask him to send someone else because he knows you. He will not be speaking to you. So when Moses said, send someone else, go, <laughs> the fire of God comes out. And, uh, and then God in the end says, it's not Aaron, your brother. Uh, he can speak well and uh, he can go with you, but you still must go. So cannot send someone else. You still must go. But you can use him as your, you know, uh, speaker, tell, tell him what, and then he going to announce, then he's going to announce, and uh, that was the way God arranged it. But there was one thing we know that God must have spoken. See, sometimes the Bible press says, summarize, we know it has to do with circumcision. He never did. So it says, Moses took his wife and his son, not immediately, we know it's a few months later, uh, nearly a year later. He returned to the land of Egypt, and uh, so he did all those things. In verse 24, it came to pass on the way at the camp, at camp that the Lord met him and sought to kill him because he was supposed to circumcise his children. It's very logical because God told Abraham in Genesis chapter uh, 17, he appeared and 18, uh, God told him, to circumcise and say anyone who is don't have this sign is Old Testament is not part of the covenant will be cut off and this sending of Moses was based on the Abrahamic covenant the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob is the one calling him now so he needed to circumcise his children and when he didn't do that he almost died before he started we do not know whether okay I cannot say we do not know because we do know 
that there are some men and women of God who die without even starting their ministry. <coughs> but we do not know how many there are, necessarily. Even Kenneth E. Hagin himself, in the book, I Believe in Vision, when God spoke to him about obeying him, and when uh, Jesus anointed his hands, and just before that, Jesus said, you are now entered the first phase. Then he has been serving God for about 15 years, full time. And then he says, after 15 years, now only first, first entering. And then he said, many men and women of God have died before entering their first phase. That means never even started. Remember, he was in the ministry for 15 years, but not counted by God. Because he was not obeying God to be a prophet. All those pastoral things are considered training. And that was not the first time that God spoke to him, Kenneth E. Hagin, when he entered the first phase. Then later the prophetic anointing came. Then he had another encounter for, on a different book, uh, under How to Be Led by the Spirit. He talked about how he was preaching in the pulpit, and then shoulder. Hey, wait, shoulder, <laughs> shoulder, shoulder, uh, and he, he, he broke his shoulder, and then God told him, it's in the book, How to Be Led by the Spirit, by Kenneth E. Hagin, and under the chapter, a hospital visitor. No, it's also in, I believe, in vision. Yes. Uh, it's also in, I believe, in vision. Yeah, I just reminded, Holy Spirit told me. Yeah, I saw that. And, uh, under the title, A Hospital Visitor. And he says the first time he saw Jesus wear sandals. Visit him. Jesus was a hospital visitor. And Jesus told him, if he didn't allow that to happen, you would not have lived past the age of 50. And Jesus told him, I will heal 99%, leave 1% as reminder. Oh, I went to 90. Wait, no, what we hear? 99% healing. Say, 1% to remind you each time you're disobedient to the prophetic call. So there is sometimes a requirement for us to do certain things before the presence of God is manifested. And some of the tasks and some of the things God gave us might not sound understandable or reasonable to us, but we just have to obey. Imagine some, some of the things that look very odd, like when you're in battle, like David. God will tell you, okay, go under the trees and wait for me. <laughs> We're fighting, no, we're gonna tree. Wait until you hear the sound of marching on top of the tree. You look at the tree. Marching, okay. Crazy, isn't it? You're going for fighting and battle and you're pretty skilled in, in, in battle warfare. You have to wait until God you hear. Then you go to your ears have to tune spiritually. Because a lot of things sounds like marching. So you hear and tell, okay, this is really very steady marching. God must have created a sound for him to hear. And he must hear the sound of marching. Boom, 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 boom. Then he said, okay, man, let's go. And then they win the battle. Every time they do that, they win. So when God wants to manifest certain presence, the presence of God for warfare is different from prayer. Because when you're in warfare, you cannot be saying, Oh, I'm touched by God's love. Oh, God is so good. No, you want a different warfare. You'll be, you be like senses anointing so strong. You go, ah, 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 ah. Oh, 100 people felt. Right? So, so the, the, your feeling and the sensation is different. But it is still the presence of God. You're still fighting the strength of God. And it's almost like Samson when he was under the anointing with, the, with a, a, a jawbone. One jawbone, he slay so many people. That's under the anointing of God. But one has to obey. When Samson lost his hair, that was it. Because there will be something of obedience tied to what God wants to do in your life. To the presence of God manifest in your life. And you learn to work with the anointing. You learn to work in the way the presence of God flow. And if you miss one or 
two important things, you can try the same technique and the presence of God will be absent. It will not work. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. Whatever God tells you to do, it's not the technique that brings the presence of God. You might go God's presence in a certain way, but it might not work if there's disobedience. There is always this interesting phenomena of task or test that links to the presence. A task or a test that God links to the presence. And He will flow with the task and test and see it to its completion and you will experience much of the presence of God. And depending on whatever presence of God, God gives to you. Like when we did the seven day all night, oh, that was very good. That was a task. Now, during the time, it might be some level of presence, but you can be sure. When you complete that, something changed. And then if you continue, whatever God asks you to do, you will encounter God in a different manner. But we have to obey Him. I know a story of one uh, man of God. God says, every morning, get up at four. So, when the man of God did that, he had a manifestation. Whatever task God asked, and sometimes we forgot the task God gave us. And we didn't obey it completely. Then we still expect God to do the same thing. Now, go keep records. But rest assured, the task and test can change. It can change. And sometimes we are so used to getting the presence of God in a certain way, God makes us change into something else so that we continue to remain submissive to Him, yielded to Him, to produce the presence of God in our life. As we meditate on this, may the presence of God increase in your life. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your presence in our life. We love Your presence. We love it. We never want to leave without your presence. But Jesus and like David, we want your presence. In fact, at the cross, when your presence left Jesus for a time, he cried out, Lama, Lama, Sabashtanai. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we know, Father, to Jesus, your presence was important. We ask, O oh God, that you give us a love for your presence, like David had, where he would rather lose everything than to lose your presence. That your presence will be precious to us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise together. Let your face shine upon us. For your presence is your face, Lord. Panin. We thank you, Father, that you let the light of your face shine on us. And in all of this life, what is this life worth if you are not with us? All the material things, all the riches, all the fame and everything in this life is worthless without your presence. We have lost your presence once in the Garden of Eden. We never ever want to be away from your presence anymore. Restore your church fully to the fullness of your presence like New Jerusalem, where we become your living temple. Restore the fullness of this presence. We don't want just a little bit. We don't want just sufficient. We don't want just it to be visible. We want all of heaven. All of heaven. Hear us, O oh Lord. 
because we know what Jesus bought for us we know he gave us everything and you say that you want us to be where Jesus is in his glory and Jesus said he wants us to be where he is and where he is is the fullness of your presence let it be so unto us O father according to your word seal this in our heart and life forevermore in Jesus name Amen praise God give Jesus a good clap all praise God bless you